Last time I had gotten up to uh, 1973, and that was the year that my boys came back with me after we'd had about a 10-year separation other than, other than seeing each other in the uh, uh, summer times. And uh, just to bring you up to just so you remember now, so now I've, I've left that trailer park job and we've started a landscaping business and Brother Roy Borders, who was head of spoken word publication at that time, has received a call, or excuse me, a letter from Pakistan and a uh, German brother, whom I met later by the name of Klaus Hofmeister, had come through Pakistan wanting to share the gospel and he himself had just gotten a hold of a few message books. And at that time he didn't have any revelation, but he just loved what he was reading. And so he stopped by in Pakistan, and they had a little small seminary going there. And Brother Noble Gill was the, like the head teacher in this little small seminary. He only had about 12 or 15 men in it. And he dropped off these books, and they began to divert away from their study of the Bible, saying, hey, these books are pretty terrific. And they really liked what they heard, so they wrote. First of all, one of the books was pertaining to the testimony by Gordon Lindsay. So they wrote to Sister Lindsay and said, what more can you tell us about this? Uh, well, actually, they wrote to Gordon Lindsay, who had written the book, and says, what more can you tell us about this? And she, the wife wrote back and, and told them, she says, my, my husband has passed away, but don't get involved in that thing. He went off at the last. And they said, well, we don't know about that, but we know we like what we're reading now. So then they wrote to the publisher of the book, Spoken Word Publications, which is Roy Borders, and who at that time, he uh, contacted Brother Perry Green about uh, this request and asked Perry if he had any desire to follow up on it. And I had been hounding Brother Perry for two or three years because something was in my heart. I wanted to help overseas. And he would tell me about some need, and I'd just say, no, that's not it. And then he'd tell me about some other need. No, that's not it. And then he gave me a big stack of letters from the brothers overseas. And he said, why don't you read through these and answer them for me? Well, I started reading them. Well, I couldn't answer them because almost all of them were asking for money or asking for this or asking for that. And I didn't have any of that to give. So I took him back and said, I can't answer this. There's just no way. And so then all of a sudden he presented this to me about Pakistan. And it kind of registered in my heart right away, yeah, that's the one I want. I want to go there. And uh, I want to pick up on that because there were some lessons uh, immediately there. <clears throat> now, while I was still yet in Tucson, and I'm mentioning this because I was sitting there looking today and I looked over and saw the Masterpiece magazine. And I thought, my goodness, that belongs in my testimony because back in 73, when I was back there, I wanted to start a magazine at Tucson Tabernacle. And I wanted the magazine to be the kind of magazine that helped the whole bride and didn't focus on one ministry or one thing. It just wanted to help the whole bride. And, and so I had gathered a bunch. At that time, certain kinds of materials were hard to find. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but little things like uh, holders for your cassettes were hard because everything was switching from reel to reel to cassette, and it wasn't easy. So I was going to list where you can buy these and where you can buy that, and uh, just different subjects. So I went to Brother Perry and told him I was interested in getting a magazine going, and he said, hey, that's great. He said, we need one. We'll put it out from the tabernacle here. He says, get going on it. I said, all right. Next service, he called me in. He said, by the way, Brother Lenny, he said, I'd like for you to make the feature article, The History of Tucson Tabernacle. And I thought, uh, that's not the direction I wanted to go. I, I wanted to help the whole bride and focus on things that would help the whole bride and not focus back to kind of one place. So I kind of lost my enthusiasm. So when I got up with Brother Biskell several years later, which was uh, in 77, I started fellowshipping with Brother Biskell, and then I moved up a little bit later, <clears throat> and I mentioned to him about I'd like to get a, see what does he think about a magazine, he said, I've had the very same thought. And so, uh, so I, the first magazine they put out, I wrote almost all of it, and, uh, and it was bride-wide. And then the edited version came back, and it was church-wide. And I thought, ah, 
there again. It didn't go the direction I wanted. There's a purpose for those things. And we know that something like what Brother Biskell is doing needs a focused magazine to, to draw people's attention. But that wasn't on my heart. So anyway, it didn't get happened. And so, so then, in 1973 then, when we took off, got ready to go to uh, Pakistan, here's another little test now coming up. And Brother, Brother Perry said, uh, ask around a couple other brothers, would they have any interest in going? And Brother Nathaniel Johnson, how many remember Nathaniel? He was here and spoke for us. Nathaniel said, yeah, he'd like to go. So he and I were talking about our plans and planning on going. He hadn't made an overseas trip. I hadn't made an overseas trip. So we were two greenhorns going to go together. And so the service before we were ready to leave, Brother Perry says, now we've got a going to do an effort out of the tabernacle here over in Pakistan. And he says, he says, it's going to take finances to get behind it. And he says, Brother Nathaniel, I want you to come up here and stand in front. And uh, brother, all the people that want to help this effort that's going on in Pakistan, I want you to come by and give Brother Nathaniel an offering. And he talked to Brother Nathaniel, Brother Nathaniel, Brother Nathaniel. And I sat out there thinking this is a test. Because I knew I was going, and Nathaniel knew I was going. And I thought Brother Perry knew I was going. And and I thought, this is a test. For some reason, I'm not included in what's going on here. And so, <clears throat> if you remember my testimony about in Chicago when I says, tell them who prayed for you. Remember that? Well, I remembered that while I was sitting there. And I thought, no, nope, this is just a test. Forget it. I'm not going to let it bother me one bit. So after the service, and, and Nathaniel said nothing. He went up front and everybody congratulated him. Have a good trip. Do a good job. Here's, we want to help you along the way. And I'm just sitting in the back and we're both going. And so, so when, after it was all over then, Brother Perry came up to me after church and had just so apologetic. He said, Brother Lonnie, I completely forgot that you might have been going and I didn't check with you and Nathaniel told me he says well brother Lonnie's going with me and he said I didn't he said I'm so sorry I said no problem no problem and I said don't worry about it and because he was so concerned I'd be crushed I said no no don't worry about it and I remember I left the church got in my car and a little voice spoke inside and said you passed the test because <laughs> you don't need the limelight you just got to serve the Lord that's all just serve the Lord so like I mentioned before, when we went to Pakistan, I was just actually a little bit fearful because I'd never been overseas and I certainly I'd never been in a, in a Muslim nation and I'd never been into that part of the world. In the Korean War, I was over in Japan and Korea, but I hadn't been among this people, so I didn't know what to expect. And, excuse me, I flipped, yeah, here it is. And so, uh, when we arrived over in Pakistan, I mentioned to you before, they, they've rebuilt everything now, but it was just like an enormous hangar. And, and when you got out of your airplane, you walked from the airplane way out here somewhere up into this hangar, and then pretty soon a little tractor came hauling a trailer, and all the luggage was on that. They unloaded everything right there in the hangar, and then there was just a little, little stands about this high with a rope kind of tied along the way, and on the other side was all the people that were waiting to see us. And while I was watching for my luggage, I noticed one particular group that they had spotted me and they were smiling and they thought, that's our man. And I could sense the very same spirit, that Christian spirit among all the Muslims. I could sense, that's it. And that little bit of fear just went away. You know, there, there it is. That's the group right there. And so we had some good meetings there. And I kind of want to linger on, uh, let me see, I, I don't think I'd even got it printed out here. Yeah, somehow I missed it. I thought I had it all typed out to remind myself. <clears throat> oh, yeah, here it is, just a little bit further down. And uh, so <clears throat> on that same trip, I went to uh, Pakistan, India, and Singapore. And in India, Brother Reginald Searle from New Zealand, whose son Howard was here, and Brother Perry Green had been there before. And also Roy Borders from Spoken Word, he had been in there and saw that they had no books, no nothing. And he had gotten a hold of a man who spoke good English and asked him to translate the Church Age book. And they printed 10,000 copies. And after they got the 10,000 copies printed, they realized that all the way through where Brother Branham was led by vision and Jesus was led by vision, he said they were led by dreams. 
Well, that completely changes the picture. Dreams are quite different than visions. So actually, he just had to junk 10,000 books. So right there, early in my ministry days, I said, uh-uh, I have, if, we, if I ever get involved in translating, we have got to watch what gets into print. Really watch it, because there were 10,000 books just right down the drain. And then I learned in my second lesson that I learned was when I was in Singapore, and I took off on this trip uh, in November, and went to Pakistan first, and then India, and then Singapore. And so <clears throat> it was getting close to Christmas time in Singapore, and they looked just like we do over there at, at Christmas time. They had all the Christmas trees hanging on all the, all the light posts. You know, it's a tropical country, but the Christmas trees were hanging on the light posts and uh, all decorated up and all sunshiny and brilliant. And, and uh, <clears throat> so it looked just kind of out like in America. So I happened to mention in there, I didn't have full understanding back then about this verse I'm about to read. But I says, you know, I says, you know, Christianity in one sense is very, very pagan. And I says, look at here in the Bible. And I read Jeremiah 10, 3. It says, for the custom of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. I says, do you do that? What's hanging on your light post? He says, the work of the hands of a workman with an axe. And they deck it with silver and gold and fasten it with nails and hammers that it not move. I said, you bring it in the house, anchor it down. And so I mentioned that. I says, the whole concept comes from paganism. And, and uh, by the time I got home, back, Brother Perry had already received a letter from the people in, in Singapore that says, Brother Lonnie believes they were celebrating Christmas in the Old Testament. <laughs> and, I, and Brother Perry laughed, and he said, Brother Lonnie, you're going to learn. He says, you've got to say it clear, really clear, or you'll be misunderstood. And so I, I did do that. Now, also on that same trip in Singapore, I've mentioned this to you before, but because of my, I'm in Singapore in my testimony right now, while I was preaching and because I was a new man to Singapore, the pastor brought his mother to the service for some reason. I do not know exactly why except God, but she spoke no English. And as soon as I finished ministering, she says, she turned to her son and says, I want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, in their language. And he says, how do you know you need that? He says, that man told me. And she says, but he, you don't understand English. She says, that man told me I need to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So she heard it completely in English. Now, I have, I've had that. That was my first experience with that. I've had it happen since then. But there's, when God wants to get it across, he gets it across, you know. So, <clears throat> so then when I was in Pakistan... Now, of course, what little ministry I had been doing back in the States wasn't very much, but it was strictly teaching. <clears throat> and yet when I finished ministering, a, a prayer line formed. I didn't call for it. The people just started coming up because they were, they were accustomed to missionaries coming over. So they just automatically formed a prayer line. Well, I have to admit now, I was a real babe, and I was, I was really unsure about how to handle all these things. This is my very first missionary trip. And so <clears throat> the people were coming up, getting ready to be prayed for, and I'm remembering the quotes where Brother Branham says, if God puts something on somebody and you pray it off, you're going to get in trouble with God. And I thought, oh God, here these people are going, they want to pray with me. How am I supposed to know if you put something on them? And I'm all confused in my mind, and I'm praying for them, and God's working miracles. And I'm spinning, saying, oh God, I hope I don't get in trouble with you and praying for people. And God's doing miracles. I want to catch this on video right now and insert it in my testimony tape because it was, I got to thinking there was one important part I left out that I, for our training, one important part. You recall when I talked about that, that first time that I was ministering in Pakistan and a prayer line just automatically formed. And I was not familiar with prayer lines as a teacher. They don't normally call prayer lines. But it just spontaneously formed. And I told you about all the supernatural that happened. But I also told you about the fact that I was, in my mind, I was confused because I hadn't faced this before. It was my, one of my first missionary trips. And the reason I was confused was because I'd heard Brother Branham say on type, if you cast the devil off of somebody, that God's allowing that 
you'll get in trouble with God. And that's what kept going through my mind, going through my mind. Well, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble with God. And so I was almost saying, Lord, forgive me and then pray for the people, you know, if I'm doing wrong. So I was, I, and I came back to my room where I was staying and I said, Lord, I don't want to ever be in that frame of mind again. And I should have been more prepared. I should have had my mindset, but it was not forgive me. But now, Lord, tell me, tell me, how should I think? How will I know that I'm not doing something wrong? Well, of course, God speaks to you out of your own background. And I've, tell, I've told some of the people this already, so some of you know it, but, but I want to get it on, included on this tape. How many of you have been in the military service? Well, yeah. <laughs> not, not too many. Okay, in the military service, they have a book called The General Orders. And the general orders tells you how to make your bed, how to polish your shoes, how to stand guard duty, how to everything. And it's just general orders. And even when you stand guard duty, you stand it a certain way and you get permission from the person that you don't know that's coming. You say certain things, they say certain things so that you don't shoot them in the process. And this whole thing is there. But under security thing, under security times, the officer of the day will change this standard guard duty so that everybody that's supposed to know will know what the, let's say, secret password is so that you don't get shot. And so the officer of the day, if there's no special command, then you follow the general orders. You don't have to say, I wonder what the officer of the day wants. You don't have to worry about that. You just follow the general orders. And then the officer of the day speaks. Well, that's exactly what the Lord laid in my heart about prayer lines. He says, my Bible is the general orders and I am the officer of the day. Until I speak to you, you follow the general orders. Freely you have received, freely give. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. I've given that to you. And if I wanted any different, I'm the officer of the day, I'll tell you. Well, it just lifted all the burden off. I didn't have to worry about it anymore. It was now back on his shoulders. He told me what my role was, and if he wanted it altered at any time, then it was his responsibility to tell me, not my responsibility to individually sort it out. Are, are you with me now? And so to me, it lifted a great thing. And, it all, and of course, that same thing applies in so many areas in your life. You've got a general orders that tells you a lot of things and you say, but what about my conditions? Just follow the general orders. If it's to be any different for you, he'll tell you. Amen. Otherwise, just follow the general orders. Amen. I had one of the little ladies that came up, little old lady, she looked, I would say, considering Pakistanis look older than we do because they very poor conditions, but I would say she was at least 60, could have been 70. But she was walking with two canes, and her steps were anywhere from six inches to ten, to ten inches long, like this, just coming up. And she got up there, and when she got right up in front of me, she kind of put out her canes and then just dropped and sat down because she was too weak to keep, keep standing. And I'm thinking, oh, God, oh, God, be with me, Lord. And I prayed for her, and I helped her up. And she took off without those canes, just took off. And she was shouting and so happy. Well, my faith came up. God, God, God was honoring his word, not me. He was honoring the word, see. And so <clears throat> then, uh, I don't remember who came up next, but I remember in the prayer line was a little mute boy. He looked like he was about 12 years old. He'd never spoken a word in his whole life. And he came up, <clears throat> and the interpreter told me, he said, he's mute. He doesn't have the ability to speak. And of course, now everything I'm saying to you, I had to say through an interpreter. And so I prayed for him, and I says, now I want you to say Jesus. And he just shook his head and pointed to his throat like that. And I says, no, no, no. I says, don't do that. I says, we have prayed for you, and Jesus has restored your voice. And he looked at the interpreter, and he looked at me, and I says, come on. That's why we prayed, isn't that? Isn't that what we prayed for? Okay, then, all right, now speak Jesus, which to them is Yesu. And he looked at the interpreter and he looked at me and he opened his mouth and out came a weak little Yesu. And his eyes got this big and then it was louder and louder and louder and we couldn't shut him off. <clears throat> 
And he was so happy. And of course, his mama, she was just beaming. Well, now the faith of the people is risen up. And so a lot of things happened. I don't remember them all. I was trying to remember what all happened there. But I remember that right after the service, <clears throat> a Muslim boy came to me. And he says, I heard about the meetings. And he says, I want you to pray for my brother. And I said, where's your brother? He said, well, he's at home. And I says, what do you want prayer about? And he said, he has epileptic seizures. And he said, he has them daily. And he's had them ever since a very, very young age. And I said, how old is he now? He said, he's 19. And I said, and now again, see, now wait a minute. I'm green at this thing. This is new to me. And I'm thinking, now this is a Muslim. And does he receive Jesus to get his healing? Or does he receive his healing to get Jesus? Now, which way is this going to go here? See, so I'm, my mind is puzzling over this. <clears throat> and I said, uh, I said, well, I said, I'd actually like to see your faith raise up before we do this. I says, how about we meet tomorrow night and let's go to the meeting together. And I says, you can sit under the word and your faith will come up. And uh, I says, could you bring your brother? And he said, no, I don't think so, because he said he doesn't hardly ever go out in public because of these seizures. Looks like he's having fits. And I said, okay. <clears throat> and I don't, still to this day, don't know why, but my ride to come and pick me up for the meeting that night never came. And so <clears throat> I don't know if I have any idea what happened at the meeting. Nothing. I'm blank. I just have no idea. But anyway, the Muslim boy that was going to ride with me, he came over. And so I told him, I said, well, this is strange. It looks like we've been left. He spoke English, by the way. I didn't have to go through an interpreter. And I, says, <clears throat> I said, if, if, if Jesus was to heal your brother, would you serve Jesus? He said, I'm a Muslim. I said, I know. But I says, if Jesus were to heal your brother, wouldn't you become a Christian? He said, I'm a Muslim. He said, we believe in Jesus. He said, he was a prophet. He says, we believe in Jesus. He says, so I, I, that's why I'm here. Oh. <clears throat> okay, now what do I do? <laughs> so I thought in my mind what Brother Branham did. I said, I said, would you be willing to do something in the name of Jesus Christ? He said, if it'll heal my brother, I'll be glad to do it. I said, okay. The next time your brother has a seizure, instruct your whole family. When the next time he has a seizure, you take off his shirt and throw it in the fire. And I says, that's going to represent the demon that's giving him these fits. And I says, if you've got the faith to throw it in the fire, God will honor your faith and your brother will be delivered. <clears throat> and he was. I went off on another trip and I came back through the city and I sent a messenger out to check with the man. And this was several weeks later. And he said that he had a seizure the very next day. And he said, I was gone. My sister threw that in the fire. This I do in the name of Jesus Christ. And said he hasn't had a seizure since. And I was back several years later. And I checked on him. He still had never had a seizure since. You know, so that's <clears throat> God, God, God. Wonderful. <clears throat> then I remember another night I was sitting in my uh, apartment, in my uh, uh, room where they had, had me in this house. And... And uh, somebody came and knocked on the door, and I went to the door, and the person didn't speak English, but I had an interpreter in the house. And, uh, and I, so he didn't speak English, but he was coming to see me. I could tell that. He wanted to see me, but he didn't speak English. So I got the interpreter. He came down to the door, and he, said, he says, they have a child that's dying, and they want to know, will you come pray? I said, where is he? And he they says, back over here within walking distance. I said, let's go. So it was very... It was l fairly late at night, and it was very, very dark. And you, you, you can't imagine this if you haven't been in Pakistan. But you go out behind the house, no street lights, uh, hardly any kind of lights at all, dark alley. And sticking out on both sides of the alley are rumps of water buffalo, because they use those all the time. And they're going to sleep because it's late at night. So you're trying to wave your way through to miss the buffalo and the things they leave along the street also. <laughs> and, and, and we finally turned and went into this very kind of looked like a stable. It looked like I was going into an open stable. And then a door opened up. We went in a room. And there was a whole gathering of maybe 10 or 12 people all standing around looking very sad. There was one little lantern, not electric light, little lantern holding in the middle of the room. And over on the side was a, a twin bed uh, with a little boy kind of up against the wall, just dying. I mean, it was, he was, looked like he was out of it. And mother, over there, of course, I mean, they do, the women do most everything from a squat. They, their kitchens, 
their utensils, their cook stove, everything is on the floor. So they, they're in a squat position doing, doing everything. So she was in a squat position on the outer side of the bed with her feet on the bed, looking at her little boy and with her fin fingers up like this and just so lamenting, he's going, he's going. And so <clears throat> when I came in, they all just looked at me soberly and uh, through the interpreter again, I told them, I said, I wanted to let you know, I'm no holy man, I have no special power, but I said, I represent the Lord Jesus Christ and he is a healer. And I said, if I, I expect that when I pray for this boy, that the Lord Jesus is gonna honor our prayers, if you are not fighting me in your mind. And I says, if you can't agree with me in your mind that the Lord Jesus can heal this child, I says, I would appreciate it if you'd step outside. Because I said, I want an atmosphere of faith. I said, I know you're not Christians. I said, I'm not even asking you to be Christians. I'm asking you to believe that Jesus can heal this child. So I prayed for the child and I told the mother, I said, I didn't say if, I said, when this child raises up, and whether it'll be tomorrow or the next day, I don't know, but when this child raises up, I said, I want you to testify to the whole neighborhood, Jesus has healed my child. And like it was just the time before, the very next day, I had to go out to a little village called Klerkabad, which was way out. And we went out there and we preached a week of meetings and I came back and again, I sent word what happened to the little boy? Now this one's a sad story. <clears throat> they, it might have been two weeks between the two. And they said the little boy the next morning woke up perky, feeling good. And she went around the te neighborhood testifying, just like I asked you, Jesus has healed my child. And about 10 days later, the boy just suddenly died. And, <clears throat> and I felt guilty and I, I told my interpreter, I says, you know, I don't know whether I'm responsible, and I still don't to this day, I don't know whether I'm responsible for that boy's death or not, because I says, when I prayed for that little boy, and I told the mother about testifying to Jesus, I also felt to tell her, be sure you feed him well when he wakes up, because he'd been sick, 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 so he's not eating. I said, be sure you feed him well, feed him well. I don't know whether she did or she didn't, but I didn't give that instruction that came into my mind. And so I told my interpreter that, and I said, I feel very bad. He says, isn't that something? He said, I felt to tell the people the very same thing. And he says, and I didn't tell them either. So I don't know whether we dropped the ball or not. Jesus did his part. We maybe didn't do our part. I can't say. In the same, in one of the meetings, I can't remember if it was the same one or another one, I remember I had two school teachers in a row. One had a very bad back and the other one had, had received some kind of disease and gone come totally blind in their eyes. I prayed for both of them and within a week both of them were back to work. Just God's wonderful way. We went out to a village called uh, Wa Kent. And Kent is merely short for cantonment. It was a military area because they had an ammunitions factory. And this village was built around this ammunitions factory. So you had to go through guards to get in. But there was a lot of Christians in, in this cantonment. So we went in. <clears throat> and I had been there before, Brother Hadayat's church. And I'd been there before. <clears throat> and so as we came in, oh, laying on the cot over here was his mother. And I, said, and I asked him, I said, isn't that your mother? Yes. I said, what's the problem? He said, she's been very, very ill for months and said she can't even get out of bed. Said, we have to take her to the toilet and we bring her out here. Said, we bring her there. There they often have a house that either the house is U-shaped wrapping around a nice, uh, an open patio because the weather's good over there most of the time. And so they have this open area in the middle and they do most of everything in this open area except in bad weather. And he, his was different in that he only had two sides of an L, excuse me, and then, and then fence around the rest of it. They'd come through a gate, through this block wall, actually come into this patio, and she was laying there. <clears throat> and uh, he says, we're bringing you out here because he said, we feel the sunshine will probably be good for her. And I says, very good, very good, that's good. I said, I'd like to pray for her before we go in for the meeting. He says, oh yes, wonderful. So I prayed for her, and she just gave me a weak little smile. And I went on in, and where I was standing, where I was standing when, it, when they brought me to the pulpit, 
I could look out past the congregation that was in this, it was just a big house, past the congregation, and I could see out these glass doors out there. And as I was preaching, my eye would fall on her every once in a while. And after a while, I saw her doing this kind of thing. And then pretty soon, I saw the blankets going up. She was lifting her feet. And then after a while, I saw her feet over on the side. And I'm just preaching this whole time, but watching what's going on. And I see she swings her feet over on the side, and she sits up on the bed. And you can just see her testing herself. And she's sitting on the bed, and she's moving around. And after a while... She stands up and she looks around and she's just kind of moving like this. And after a while, she starts walking around the bed. And so then when it got that far, I finally said, Brother Hadayat, God has healed your mother. And they all turned and looked and of course the congregation erupted, you know, then praise God, praise God, praise God. <clears throat> so God vindicates his word. And I could go on and on and on about those stories, but God vindicates his word. And so... So if, you, if a person's new at these things, they take the glory to themselves of, you know, tell them who prayed for you. But, but it isn't. It's a vindication of the word because these signs follow them that believe. And it's a vindication of the word. So I just rejoice in those things. And I, I personally just expect it. It isn't like I say, oh, God, I just expect it because God said so. Now, in all honesty, when people come up for prayer here, I just expect it. Not because it's a missionary field, that it's not the idea. It's still God's word, whether it's overseas or here. So. But I've also found that God works more supernatural in the early days of our introduction to catch the attention of the people. Remember, Brother Ram said divine healing is a bait on the hook. So he often does more to, to attract right at first than he does just a little bit later. I went to, back to Pakistan between 73 and 84. I went back maybe only about six times <clears throat> into Pakistan, and then it, it appears that, appears, I'm only guessing, it appears that the embassy found out I was a Christian minister. And every time I'd write for a visa, <clears throat> the, uh, the visa wouldn't come back, wouldn't come back, wouldn't come back. And finally, I'm up to, to departure time, and I call them on the phone and said, hey, I'm, it, my departure time is coming up. I've got to have my passport. I can't travel without it. Well, we're very, very sorry, sir, but we were checking on your visa back in Pakistan. The paperwork hasn't come back, but we'll return your passport. And they gave me that routine. They never said, no, you can't go in, but they gave me the stall for the next 12 or 14 years. Every time I'd write, I'd get the stall. Every time I'd write, I'd get the stall. So I didn't go back again and, and from 84 all the way up until Brother Ronnie Cobb and I went well, just a few years ago, I don't remember now when it was, 98, 99, might have even been 2000, I don't remember. But just recently was the first time I'd been back since 84, or maybe 86 at the latest. And so <clears throat> that was what was happening. So as, as before I left the work over there and couldn't go back anymore, I, I told one of the brothers I was working with very, very closely that I said, brother, we have got sin in the camp. And he says, who is it? What is it? And I says, I don't know what it is. I don't know who it is. But I said, God is not blessing what we're doing the way he could. He's not blessing it. And I said, the only thing I can think of is sin in the camp. Well, he just looked at me kind of blank. And, and I had no idea who it was or what it was. But I, but I had already was aware of that pattern. That hidden sin in the camp stops the blessings of God. And so it wasn't any time until after that I got a letter from a uh, former Muslim man now living in Germany. And he wrote a letter, hot stinging, said, what kind of people do you associate with? And one of the ministers that we were working with there close in Pakistan had relatives in Germany. And it turned out every time he'd go visit his relatives, he was having an affair with this, this man's wife. Now, they were at odds with each other, and so she was turning in other directions. But the very, to be honest, the very man I was talking to was the man who was having an affair every time he went into Europe. And so God had put his finger on it, but I didn't know. And then once it was all exposed and we separated away from that, then getting a few more years of getting somebody trained again, which was Brother uh, Rashid Gill, that you know him, he's been here, then, then the thing, the work began to go forward again. 
just things you learn in the missionary field. When I first started working over in Lithuania and Latvia in that area, <clears throat> and Brother Dima that was here, the, he's our translator over there, and he was here several years ago. He was a slim, trim little fellow back then, but he's put on some weight, got a wife and a child now, but so quite different than the little boy that was here that you saw. But <clears throat> anyway, he, I asked him, how's your church going? And he said, no, it's okay. I said, how, is it growing? He says, no. He said, we haven't grown for years. I said, you're not growing at all. He said, no. I said, have you got contention in the church? He said, ah, all the time. I said, that's why you're not growing. And I said, what seems to be the problem? He said, well, I don't really want to talk about it. I said, hey, we're here to iron it out. Let's, let's see what it is. He said, well, he says, there's two people that both think they should be the pastor and both think they should be the minister. And he says, and yet they both preach and they both kind of bump each other when they get in the pulpit. And uh, I said, yeah, you can't have that. We must have unity. So, so next time I was over there and I got with Pavel and I talked with him about that, he says, I knew it. I said, yeah, but we can't let it ride. We've got to deal with it. So Pavel went over and talked directly to the man who was the primary cause of the problem. And, uh, and Pavel handled it so wonderfully that the man just absolutely repented. Absolutely repented. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm the culprit, you know. So he repented. But still the church didn't grow. And then the more I watched it, the more I realized that I don't think the man who's standing in his pastor is even a called man. He's just a good man, probably make a good elder, but I don't think he's a pastor. So again, we talked it over. <clears throat> and Pavel said, you know, I've had the very, very same feeling that I, I think that's the problem. So then not too long ago, Brother Alexi, whom we support, who's from the Vilnius Church, he was asked to come up and minister. They enjoyed it. They asked him, would you mind sticking around a while? So, so they've now set him in to do the office of pastor, at least until somebody else rises up, or, uh, or he remains as pastor. We don't know which it'll be yet, but the church is flourishing. People are starting to come in. The spiritual life is coming up. Get the mat, right man in the place and contention out of the church, and it grows. It just grows. So you, you, you just learn these things. When you watch overseas for a while, you watch these things. At first, you want to take it to yourself. You know, like, man, I'm failing. I am really failing. And then pretty soon, I have to put this honest, pretty soon you have, somewhere, you have to start having confidence that the Holy Ghost is leading your life. Because if you're always questioning yourself and blaming yourself, you'll never go anywhere. Somewhere you have to say, hey, Holy Ghost, what are you trying to tell me? And start resting in Holy Ghost leadership. Otherwise, problems. <clears throat> in Pakistan, we support uh, the, the translation and the printing. We're printing two books a month. We support about four ministers, two translators. We've put in several computers, search programs. Uh, we, pay f we pay to keep our contact men on the net each week, each, all, each month, so that we can email back and forth. And of course, bikes and cars and motorcycles and tape recorders, tape duplicators, blank tapes, that's automatically part of it. We, we supply most all of that to Pakistan. We never talk about Pakistan much, but just to let you know, yes, your money is doing that. I had told you that we had started the church in Hawaii. <clears throat> and in 1976, Jeff and I were over there. I think Jeff was with me on that trip. We were over there, and Brother Minnow Friesen contacted us. And he says, hey, I've been invited to speak a convention in Gisborne, New Zealand for Brother Searle. And he says, I'd like to come through uh, Hawaii and relax there a few days. If you guys got a place, and what can we do? And we said, hey, you are very welcome. You can preach for us. We'll give you a tour of the island. And then if you don't mind, I'd like to go with you to New Zealand. And said, hey, you're on. Let's do that. So he came on over. We went around the islands. And then, and then uh, uh, when the time came, then I went on over with him. And uh, let me think how to, how to go into this now. They... Uh, that I, I learned so much on that trip, so much. And first one was we, we had the dedication of the church. And, every, and, and when they were there, I bought a clock for the back wall like that for their church because they didn't have one in the church. So I thought, well, here's my gift for the dedication. And every time Brother Searle would see me, he said, clock's still running, you know. And even Howard told me the same thing when he was here. And this is 1976, and he was here. He says, your clock's still running. And so <clears throat> it was... Uh, so anyway, 
after the convention was over and Brother Menno Friesen went back home, I remained there because I, I was going to take off on a trip from there. And I didn't care whether I preached or not. I've never cared that. I just, if God opens the door, I'll step through it. If he doesn't, I don't feel antsy about why I need to get in the pulpit. And so Brother Cyril asked, mentioned one day, he, says, he said, have you wondered why I haven't asked you to preach? I said, well, tell you the truth, I figure if, if God's in it, I will. And if he's not, then I won't. And, and he says, well, Brother Lonnie, he says, you're a divorced man. And he says, that therefore, he says, I, I don't feel like I can let you in my pulpit. And I says, well, <clears throat> I feel I have a right because, and I went through just a few of the things. And he says, and, he says, I don't think even your pastor, Perry Green, agrees with you being out in the field as the divorced man. Well, that hit me when my own pastor didn't agree with me, he said. So I was very concerned that I sent off a wire right away. We didn't have email back in those days. Sent off a wire right away to Brother Perry. He said, Brother Perry, here's what's been said. I need to know how, where you stand on this. <clears throat> so I'm very torn up about this. So he, Brother Searle says, you gather all your facts as to why you think you can, and I'll gather all the facts why I think you can't, and let's talk tomorrow. Now, all this is very smooth, the best of nature that you can, there's no contention, no argument. <clears throat> and I said, okay, let's do that. So we got together, we exchanged ideas, but it didn't seem to settle anything. At least he didn't say, okay, now you're accepted, or, and I didn't say, you've convinced me I shouldn't be there, you know. It was just like we just exchanged ideas, and after we finished, he says, but, he says, can you give us testimony? And I said, yeah, sure, I can give testimony. So I gave testimony about what I learned about body, soul, and spirit, and how I learned to separate this, and how I learned to separate that. And, <laughs> and uh, so afterwards, he says, that was really great. You got some more testimony? And I said, yep, sure do. So I gave him three nights of testimony. <clears throat> and so then he said, Brother Lonnie, he said, I've got to shoot straight with you. He said, I have two men in my church that he says are chomping at the bit to be ministers. And he says, they're both divorced men. And he says, I have no handle on them except their divorce. And he says, I don't want to let them go because I don't think they're called men. They'll do nothing but create problems. He said, if they had your attitude and your spirit, he said, I'd let them go. But he says, if I let you in as a divorced man, he says, I've lost my hold on these guys. And he says, I just can't do it. And I says, understand, no problem, no problem. So, but I was still torn up about that comment about even Brother Perry doesn't agree. <clears throat> so just before I left over there, we were having communion service and we were just a little small group of people. There might've been 25 or 30 of us. And I remember we took communion and we were standing in a circle and Brother Searle still had the gifts operating in his church, which I asked him then, I said, Brother Searle, I says, now that you have a church, because they were meeting in a public hall, they said they had to empty the beer cans out and <coughs> wipe the cigarettes out and open the windows and get the smell of smoke and the dance and the party from the night before out. Now they've got their own place. I says, now that you've got your own place, are you going to put the gifts in the back room? He said, no, sir. I says, well, you know what the prophet said. He says, yeah. He says, that's one of the reasons I'm not putting him in the back room. And I said, may I ask why? He said, yeah, because he says, Brother Bram said, when these gifts mature, we'll set them in order. He says, our gifts are just beginning. So he says, so he says I'm, we're not ready, we're babies. He says, so I'm not going to set them in order. And that's the first time I'd heard anybody think that way. It was a whole new thought pattern to me. I thought, hmm, now there's something different. So anyway, we gathered at this communion service, and suddenly somebody broke out in tongues, and somebody broke out in interpretations, and it was speaking directly to me to encourage me to continue on, not go home, but continue on on my trip. And, and when we got all finished, I just, I just stood there tooking it in. I thought, God, you are so wonderful. But it was said in a real camouflaged way. And when we finished, the people all looked at each other and says, I know we had tongues interpreted, but what did they say? And everybody said, I don't know. I'm not sure what that meant. I knew exactly what it meant. It was for me. God was encouraging me to continue on. But I still had this cloud of 
your pastor doesn't agree either. So I went on, I left New Zealand, I went into Australia, and I, and I preached in Melbourne and Sydney, and had, and excuse me, I testified in Melbourne and Sydney, <laughs> and then I went from there to Singapore, testified in Singapore, went from there to India, testified in India, went into Pakistan, and the brother there that we were working with, he, he came to the airport, picked me up, and as we were driving back to his house, he says, let me stop by the post office and put, put, pick up my mail. And I said, yep, sure, go ahead. So he ran in, brought out a little box of envelopes and various things and set them down in the seat between us in the car. And I looked over and, and he, I says, are you on the mailing list from Tucson Tabernacle? Because I saw a Tucson Tabernacle tape. I recognized it right away. And he says, yeah, he says, I get them every month. For regular, he says, I listen to Brother Perry all the time. He said, hey, that's great. He says, you want to hear it? And I said, yeah, let's do it. So he shoved it in the car. And Brother Perry starts out saying, Brother Lonnie, I don't know whether this tape will reach you somewhere in the world or not. But he says, Brother, I'm with you. I'm behind you. We stand for your ministry. You preach. You cast out devils, heal the sick. And he says, We're with you, Brother. We're with you. And I thought, God, how supernatural. Clear on the other side of the world. And there the tape reached me. And it was the only tape I listened to on the whole trip. <clears throat> My. God has a way. So I left from Pakistan then. And I went on into Europe. This was a complete round the world trip. <clears throat> I went in, on into Europe. And I preached in Holland, England, and Germany. And then Nathaniel Johnson, the one who had been with me in Pakistan on the first trip, he flew over and joined me in, I think it was England. And then we hopped back over the channel and we ministered in Germany and Holland and then went back into England again. And our, 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 my purpose of going into England from 76 on, the... Uh, uh, the man who was the primary lead man in spreading the message in England at that time, he, had, he was a charismatic from England, and he had come to a full gospel businessman meeting in Phoenix. And Brother Perry used to always go up to those full gospel businessmen's meetings because Brother Bannerman used them, so, and several of the other brothers did also. And, of course, Carl Williams was still the president, and he was a believer in Brother Branham. So during this meeting, uh, Carl had called up a brother and said, Brother, how about giving us a little testimony? And the man started a testimony about William Branham. And then after about five or ten minutes, because he was just asked to testify, not preach, he sat down. Brother, how about a little testimony from you? Well, it was another believer. He picked up where the first brother left off and just carried on with the testimony and sat down. And about five brothers in a row just did that. They just gave that much of the testimony. This one added, this one added, this one added, this one added. And then they invited Brother Perry to come up. And so Brother Perry added not only to the testimony, but about his own personal experiences. So... Immediately then after the service, this charismatic man came up to uh, Brother Perry and he says, I want to latch on to you and stay around you. I want to know what this is about. He said, well, he says, come on back to Tucson with us. We'll give you a place to stay. And uh, so he came and he stayed with, uh, can't remember the brother's name now. But anyway, he stayed, stayed with this brother and... And then he and the brother were in fellowship all the time, and brothers were feeding him the message. And he went back to England just on fire. And he was sweeping England and firing up groups and getting groups going. And, and everybody was just rejoicing. And it was all, all were small groups, so they were all home meetings at the time. So the whole thing was going on fire. And this went on for about two and a half years, maybe three. And then it came out that he was living an immoral life on the side. And it just crushed the movement in England, just crushed it. And everybody pulled like little wounded animals back into their homes and didn't know who to trust or what to do. And so I saw that, I knew that, and I had known the man who had made the fall. So I kind of had a round picture of the whole thing. So for the next four or five years, I just was continually going back into England, trying to boost the people up, boost the people up, help them heal their wounds, uh, quit staying in little groups, start forming, let's get some churches going. And we did that. And during, during that meantime, while we were there, while I was home one time, the message had gotten up into Scotland. And this group up in Scotland, from Glasgow, Scotland, this br brother was a, uh, how can I describe it? 
He was a kind that you'd expect him to be running a, a, a boy's ranch or something like that. He loved to work with youth, and he was always creating things for them to do kind of thing. And he had a church. And so he brought a bunch of his youth over to Tucson, and they attended the church. And, but they just barely had been introduced to the message, just barely. And one of the girls there that she came, I can remember it just as well as anything, she, and they were not a wealthy group. So this may have been the only dress the girl had because they all dressed in pants back home. So she put on maybe her only dress, and I think it was. And it was about six inches above her knee, maybe four inches above her knee. And of course, everybody was babes in the Lord back then and didn't know quite how to handle the sword that had been placed in their hand. And one of the sisters walked, sweeted up, walked up sweetly to her and says, Honey, you never make it to heaven in a dress like that. And well, because she didn't have any idea what the woman was even talking about because she wasn't introduced to the message. And so then the next day, we took the whole group out to uh, Eagle, uh, no, not Eagle Rock, Sunset Mountain to show them where the whirlwind had been and where the pyramid rocks were cut out and where the tops were cut out of the trees. We took them out there and it was a hot day and she was wearing a coat. And I asked somebody else from the group, if she got a fever or what's the problem? She says, no. She says, that woman says, you know, about her dress. And she said, she doesn't have any other dress. So she's wearing a coat to cover herself up. So I thought, oh my, I think this group needs help. So I started getting acquainted with them better. And so then now, this is all during this England time. So then I started including going up to Glasgow to work with this group up there. And the second time I was there, the Spirit of the Lord spoke in my heart and says, the pastor will not receive this message. Lay in all the word you can before this door is closed so that the elect seed can see what this message is about. So I did that. I didn't just preach, you know, normal light stuff. I poured it in. And of course, Brother Brian Locke that's been here with the meetings, he was a result of that. And the fellow that came with him, he was a result of that. And another group in Glasgow, they're all a result of that. And sure enough, the man did reject the message. And he finally got to the place where he says, I want to put it to a vote. He says, do we continue on the way we used to be, or do we follow this William Branham message? I want to put it to a vote. And the majority voted to continue on, because they were actually living a kind of a loose lifestyle. And, <clears throat> and so he said, okay, that's the way we'll go. Well, the ones that saw what had been being preached, they just left. And they, they started two little groups. They were on very opposite ends of the place. And they started, started two little groups. So that's how the message started there in, in uh, in Glasgow. <clears throat> in about 1977, as I mentioned previously, I met Brother Biscoll at a, a meeting up in, up in Canada, <clears throat> and I went uh, straight home with him from that convention. And, and uh, Jeff was there with me, and Paul had come up also, and then they drove in the truck that we had there across, and I flew on with Brother Biscoll on home. And we, we were having meetings, and well, Jeff and Paul drove, drove on over. And uh, that was 77. In 78, he contacted me. He said, Bill Lani, I've been praying and praying and praying about this. He says, I want you to come up and work with me. And he says, and he, and he offered me a, a monthly support, excuse me, which I'd never had before. But I wasn't enticed by the monthly support. I was enticed by the fact that Brother Ed and I worked together so well, and I enjoyed working with him. So I went on uh, up there with him <clears throat> and first thing we did was we were we because i was up there quite often before i even moved up there he had a radio broadcast how many remember brother biscoll's radio broadcast one two three four five yeah few, six seven yeah eight nine ten yeah okay so anyway we, we <clears throat> he was on about uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 radio stations around the united states canada and then in two stations in south africa and so every time I'd go up there, he would usually pull me into the radio broadcast and we'd do an exchange on the radio. And I really enjoyed it and he seemed to enjoy it and we felt very free. And Brother Roger, who was his associate minister at that time, he'd run the soundboard and get a good recording. <clears throat> so we decided then that a church was needed in Seattle because we got the most responses of any city we got out of this gut from Seattle. So we started broadcasting on our radio broadcast that I was going to be holding meetings in the city and we rented a hall right in the bottom of the Seattle Needle that you've seen at the Space Needle, the big thing. So it would be easy for people to find, just go to the Needle and down in the bottom of the Needle there, we'd be there. So we had the uh, meetings there and then after we'd 
held meetings there for about a week or two. Then in the meantime, we'd found another place and we took our crowd that was interested then and moved to something not quite as expensive as the needle. And then, <clears throat> and then we started a little group there in uh, Seattle and ended up in a little church right on the suburbs of Seattle in a little place called Maple Valley. And a fellow was working with us at the time who had come in for, I have no idea why, but when we started working, he had gone up to Brother Biscoll's and Brother Biscoll sent him down to work with Jeff and I down there. And so out of a series of circumstances anyway, we ended up turning the church uh, to him. And of course, I didn't feel I was the pastor. Jeff was too young, and I've never felt pastoring was my call. So <clears throat> but in about 1980, Brother Biscoll said uh, he'd like to get involved in missions. And he said, where do you suggest we start? I said, India. And he says, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. And, uh, and so we, he started going with me then over, over to India. And I told him, I says, they desperately need a printing over here. There's no books in their language. They desperately need it. And so Brother Biscoll saw the need. And so I went over with him then from 80 to 84. We made a few trips. And by the time 84 was finished, we had translators going, a printing operation going, small at that time compared to what it is now, but it was on its way. And uh, we also reached the place where we had to make a decision between radio and missions because we found we couldn't give the time to both. We had to make, okay, are we going to go radio or are we going to go missions? Well, we saw we were getting better positive permanent results out of missions than we were out of radio. So he dropped the radio broadcast and we started focusing on, on the missionary work. <clears throat> Once the translators were in place, the printing press was in place, and the books were beginning to be cranked out in several different languages, I really felt my job in India was finished, and I've never been back since that time. Since, since that time, I felt, it's in your hands, Brother Ed, run with it, I'm finished. And so I've never been back. <clears throat> and uh, back in about 1978, Brother Biskel took me to a meeting with him in Norway to minister Brother Per Johansson's uh, annual convention there and they picked me up there and I ministered in Norway then every year from 1978 to about 1988 I was one of the preachers at the convention there was always two preachers for many years it was Ed and I but for some years it was other other people but I was one that stayed and I finally told him hey you've had enough out of me get somebody else so they got somebody else about that same time, during that period, their brother uh, Ed and Jeff and I were holding a convention in uh, uh, Helsinki, Finland. And I had told Jeff, I said, Jeff, I would like to stay behind after the convention and help Brother Matty Honkinen, who was our translator, get a church started. Because I said, there's a few people in the area who are interested, but they have no church. They just gather once in a while or contact Matty or read the books. But I said, they need a church. And so uh, Jeff, uh, excuse me, Ed had to leave from there to go earlier, and Jeff and I were going to stay on, but we hadn't talked to Maddie about helping him start the church. And so when Maddie drove Ed to the airport, Ed told him, he says, now Jeff and Lonnie have it in their hearts that if you wish, they'll remain behind and help you get a church started. And he said, to Ed's shock, he said, Maddie started crying. And he thought, you know, are they thinking we're rejecting him or something's wrong with him? And he says, no, Brother Ed, no, Brother Ed. He says, it isn't that. He said, I was praying, God, I need to get a church started. Have one of these brothers or more stay behind and help me get it started. So we stayed with him then and helped get the church started. And it's just really blossomed nicely since then. And there's several others around Finland now also. <clears throat> I can't remember what year it was, but Jeff and I, uh, I think Jeff was with me, we made a trip through Europe and into Israel. And I don't remember the year, Brother Jeff, but Brother Perry Green was covering the cost of our ticket on that particular trip. He had a travel agency, so he could arrange tickets kind of any way he wanted. So he was kind of feeding us tickets as we went along. We didn't have our whole itinerary. He'd give us a ticket from here to here, and then a ticket from there to there. And it's kind of, he was just feeding the tickets. And when we got to Israel, Jeff and I toured around a few days, and then a brother, Mike Yarbrough from, from Tucson, came and joined us that time. And he brought a message from Brother Perry that I want Jeff to come home because he's not ministering, and I don't want to pay for tickets for him the rest of the way. You remember that, Jeff? And, <clears throat> and I felt really grieved in my heart 
because I felt Jeff, for his own experience, was to make the whole trip with me. And yet, I, I was, uh, uh, I don't know whether to say respectful or fearful, I don't know what, but I didn't want to counter my pastor's opinion, especially when he was paying for the ticket, but I, I held it to myself, and I thought, I, I think Jeff should go all the way with me. And of course, back in those days, Jeff will testify, we were very broke all the time, very broke. And, and so I, I didn't know what to say, so I let it drop, and Jeff came on home. And we, then we, you can't fly directly from Israel to Pakistan because they have no international relationships. You have to land in a neutral nation in between and then take another plane and go on in. So we had to spend one night in, in uh, Tehran, Iran. And I remember when I went into the hotel room, there was uh, the water and the glass ready. And I asked the man in the room, I said, is this filtered in clean water or is this out of your tap? And he says, no, no, special, prayer, special water for tourists. I said, okay. I drank it and I got so sick. As soon as I got sick, I really thought I should have brought Jeff. I felt like I was getting a spanking for not, for not bringing Jeff. I should have spoken up. God was teaching me, you know, to not be so mild-mannered. There's a time to speak up. There's a time to keep your mouth shut. But when you're supposed to speak up, better speak up, you know. And so I just felt that way. So on that trip, we went to Pakistan, Nigeria, Zaire, and Ghana, and Brazil, and home. And I was sick the whole time up until we finally were heading over to Brazil and it finally began to leave. It was the kind of thing that if I wasn't preaching, I had to be sitting with my head between my legs because I didn't have the strength to stand. And when we had gone through Pakistan, Nigeria, by the way, in Nigeria now, they didn't have a message church in Nigeria at that time. Pakistan, we'd already started. Nigeria, Nigeria had heard the message, but they didn't have a, a message church. And a deacon in one of the Pentecostal churches had sent us a letter and said, I hear you travel, and we don't have a message church in our country. Would you come? My pastor is open to the message. Would you come and preach in our church about what you know about William Branham? Yep, sure will. So we went in and we ministered. We ministered there, and it seemed like the word spread from there just wonderfully. And in no time, that ch church didn't become a message church, but a couple of others sprung up out of that. And in fact, uh, what's the brother's name? Who's a king now? He was at family camp. John Ogu, yeah. John Ogu, he's the king of the tribe over there now, but he always calls me his father in the gospel because he says, it was from the testimony that you left in that church that I heard and I started the church. So he started one right there. So we had a little, little touch in there anyway. Then from there we went into Ghana and I had been told that in Ghana you can, you can get into the country just by showing your passport you don't need to be safe. You can show your passport and say, you're only going to be here for the weekend. I'll leave my passport here as security and pick it up on Monday when I come back. So I'd been told that. So I come in. I got my suitcase. I come up to the immigration place. He said, may I see your visa? And I said, well, I was told. He said, sir, I didn't ask you what you were told. I said, show me your visa. And I started getting out my passport. He says, sir, do you have a visa? I said, well, I was told. He said, I didn't ask you what you were told. Do you have a visa? I said, no, sir. He said, pick up your bag. I said, okay, follow me. And he walked me back out on the ramp, said, get on that plane. I said, where's it going? He says, I don't know. I don't care. You don't have a visa? You're not staying here. And he gave my passport to the steward and says, when the man pays you for a ticket, you can give him his passport back. And I got on the plane. Where's it going? I don't know. He didn't care. <laughs> so I said, I said, where, where are we going? And he said, St. David. Ah, that's the very next place I was going to. I said, hey, that's wonderful. I got a ticket right here, you know. And uh, so because I was leaving from there to go to St. David, which was the change airport to go to Brazil. So it just worked out beautiful. But it, it was a very uh, shaking experience. <laughs> In about 1981 or 82, Brother Willie Retief contacted me 
And he says, well, Lonnie, he says, I've been into Malawi a few times, and some of our other brothers from South Africa have been in there. And he says, Brother Harold Hildebrand has been in there just the previous year, and he had had very, very good results. He says, but there's no church. He says that people all gather together and they love to hear it. And he says, then they go back to their churches. He says, then they gather together and they hear what's preached by South Africans or Herald. He says, then they go back. He says, we need a message church. And he says, you've started churches before. Will you go in with me? What do they need? I says, all they need is more word. All they need is more word. And he says, well, why don't you come in with me? Let's see where we can get started. I said, okay, let's go. So I went in, and he says, now, I don't want to preach. He says, I, I want you to do the preaching. And I said, I, whatever you want. I, it's okay. So anyway, we got in there, and, they, and the people began to pull on him to go off to this church and go off to that church and preach while I was preaching this other one. So as it turned out, I preached either 32 or 37 messages, and he preached 14, and out of that, bang, the church was birthed. And the, and, uh, the uh the first place we went on that trip was the one I've told you about where we were sleeping in the jungle hut with the mud walls and the grass roof and laying in bed and something's crawling over me. You remember when I, that was the rats that were crawling me over me at night. And there were no lights, no electricity. And so you're wondering, is this a snake? Uh, is, am I going to be worse off by hitting it or am I going to be worse, <laughs> off, better off by laying still? What do I do? And uh, so anyway, it turned out it was big rats. Without their tail, they were about that long. And the, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we went, we preached there, and then we went on into the city and preached there. And, and then the people were so on fire, which was exactly what you want, that they go back to their churches and start testifying, and the church kicks them out. <laughs> and that's how the churches start. It isn't so much that they want to form a church. They, you get them so full, they've got to testify, the church will boot them out. Now they've got to start a church. So, so that's the way it happened. So Brother uh, Paddington that's been here at our meetings, he was part of that first group. Brother Dixon Kandoji, he was part of that first group. And so we, uh, we uh, so that, that, that was the way it started when I was working with Brother Willie. On that same trip, I met Brother Jeremiah Mkanganwe from Zimbabwe. And the next year, I started going into Zim, in Zimbabwe with him. But the next year after that first meeting with Brother Willie, I, uh, Brother Biskel and I made another swing. And, we, and on that swing, uh, let me see, we went up into India and Nepal. And I went over to Pakistan. I went from India to Pakistan to Nepal. And Brother Biskel went somewhere because we were together in India. And then we separated and we gathered again in Nepal. And I can't remember where he went. But anyway, on that trip, we went through, went, went through that rigmarole, and then we came back down to Malawi, and then down to South Africa. And I remember on that one, it set a record for me. We were gone about 92 days, and we preached 114 meetings. And I was dragging <clears throat> when we got home. And so anyway, when Brother Biscoll went with me in there, he's, a, he's, he's always, uh, he can grab it and run with it. And so when we got in there, it was the very same thing. We need translators. We need books. And so we talked to Paddington, who was a truck driver at that time. We said, how much are you making driving a truck? He said, $75 a month. He says, if we give you $75 a month, will you translate? Oh, yeah, I'll be glad to. OK? You're guaranteed, 75 a month. OK? But it wasn't in him. Once he was set free from truck driving, and he had 75 a month, all he could do was burn up the place testifying what God had done in this generation. And he would get a book translated about every two or three months. But in the meantime, he started a group in this college and that college and that college. And he started 11 groups the first year. And, and we said, well, he's not in his place, but he's doing a good job anyway. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so, so we just kind of let it go. Because Dixon, Dixon, Dixon became the pastor, and he was kind of going out from Dixon's church. So Dixon said, hey, he's doing a great job. We need somebody else for a translator. So we said, OK. So we stayed behind Paddington, and he, he started going out. And so, <clears throat> so to Malawi, and then also including Zimbabwe, we went back for about four or five years in a row, and we put the brothers in Malawi then in contact with the brothers in Brazil 
because they were starting to go into neighboring Mozambique, which preaches in, which speaks Portuguese, and that's what Brazil speaks. So we put, put because I knew the brothers in Brazil, we put the two together, and so they started shipping the Portuguese translations into Malawi to use over the border in, uh, in Mozambique. And so then only about four or five years we worked there steadily, and then jumping forward then in 1996, Dixon contacted myself, Brother Willie Retief, and Brother Harold Hildebrand, and called us the pioneers, and he wanted to hold a pioneers convention, and we that had helped get it started originally would be the speakers in the convention. And I thought, hey, that's great, we'll do it. And he says, and he kept telling me, he said, I want you to see the fruit, the harvest of your fruit. He said, I want you to see the fruit. Well, I had no idea what he meant. So we get over there, and they have hired a soccer stadium, and we're and uh, the people start coming and coming and coming and coming and just filling up one side and the stadium people that ran it said they know their seating and about how many people were going and they said you've got over 12,000 people here well at that time it was the largest group ever gathered in in in, in the message group in in Africa then the one in, in Zaire a few months ago topped that one but that was their biggest group and it was kind of overwhelming and I felt so bad because here we are ministering to 12,000 people. I'm using my overhead projector. Our screen is about, it's about 20 foot by 20 foot, but it's not enough for 12,000 people. And I felt so bad because all the center group was feeding on what I was saying and the rest of the group were looking and listening. And I, so if we ever do it again, we'll, we'll have to set it up totally different. But anyway, new, new experience. It was on that very same trip that I invited my daughter Lonnie Kay to go with me. Now Lonnie Kay was the one that I told you on night one that, that she would never come in the summertime to visit me. And the other three would come all the time, but she would never come. And I always wondered what's wrong. She talked to me okay, everything seemed to be okay, but she wouldn't come. So on that trip, I took her over because one, I wanted to get acquainted with my own daughter. And two, she had become an excellent photographer, and I wanted her to come along and, and photograph, photograph the trip. So I told her I needed a camera person for the trip. Well, of course, that was mostly bait. It was mostly daddy wanted to be with his daughter, but nevertheless, she bit the bait, and she came. She, and and uh, so while we were on the trip, I happened to mention to her, I says, how come you would never come? And so here's what had happened. I have to just tell you the incident, because she reminded me of it. I had gone back to visit my wife when I was lift, list, living in Tucson. And I had gone back to, something's happening. I had gone back to visit my wife and I was uh, sitting at the dining room table talking with her. Whew, sounds going wacko. Talking, talking with her and, and Sharon, my oldest daughter, came running in and just burst right into the conversation. And I, and I told her, uh, I said, don't do that, honey. Don't do that. Your mom and I are talking. And, and my ex, she says, this is my house. You're not going to speak to my kids like that in my house. And I said, hey, it's my kids too. She says, get out. I said, no, come on. Let's talk. She says, get out. I said, no, Ann, let's talk. She says, get out. And so she got up and called the police. And so... Uh, you know, I could tell you the rest of the story. It was really humorous, but I won't go into that. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Lonnie Kay was standing in the hallway, and she said, I heard all that. And she says, in my young mind, what was said was, if Mama can put Daddy out, I better be a good friend to Mama, or she'll put me out. And so she said, that's the way it registered in my mind. So she says, I worked my, all my young leaders to stay close to mama. I didn't want her to put me out. Funny how kids register things. <clears throat> so speaking of Malawi then, I'm not quite sure how many is Jim Crook here tonight? Yeah, Jim, how many do we support in Malawi? 15, 15 ministers being supported in Malawi. And uh, we, of course, we've helped on cars and motorcycles and computers and all kinds of things over there that we're still helping since our work in, in Malawi and since Paddington came here and we kind of renewed old acquaintances. In uh, 1984, uh, Brother Searle, the same one from New Zealand, was in Korea. 
And it was the first time that the message had been brought in, uh, let's say, by a message minister. The books had gotten in, and one guy had raised up with complete fanaticism and uh, kind of created problems with it and then moved out of Korea. But now Brother Searle went in, <clears throat> and let me just tell you these two stories, because Brother Searle has also believed that these signs follow them to believe. He just believes those things. So he said, after he had finished preaching and trying to lay out to the people the seven seals, he says, now God vindicates his word by, uh, by the supernatural. And he says, if any of you want divine healing, he says, please feel, come, feel free to come forward. I'd be glad to pray for you. And he said, the first thing that happened was a group of people stood up and picked up a man who was a quadri quadriplegic. Couldn't move his arms, couldn't move his legs. And just sat him down in front, and the man just fell over because he couldn't even balance himself up. And he says, I'm thinking, oh, God, this is the time, you know. And God healed him. And God healed him. And so, so then the next day, there was a, a doctor who volunteered work at uh, one day a week. He gave volunteer work to groups in small villages. And he was part of that church. So he asked Brother Cheryl, said, say, I'm going out to this village to uh, do some volunteer work. Would you just like to come along, kill a little time, and see what happens? He said, yeah, I said, I'd love to do that. So he said, they went out, and he went into this burned out church. He said, all the walls were still there, but there were no windows in the holes in the walls, and there was no roof. But he set up a little table there, and the people from the village started coming in. And he says, pretty soon, he said, a mother and her daughter and the daughter's little baby walked up to him and through an interpreter said to him, we were in the meeting last night. Now, the mother said, I was in the meeting last night. She says, I saw what Jesus did for that man. She says, this is my daughter, and her little baby was born blind. Can, your, can you think Jesus can heal this little baby? And so he says, well, I'm sure Jesus can. He says, whether he will, we'll see. But he says, I know he can. So he said, I laid my hands on the little baby, and he said, the baby burst into the most awful scream that he said, I thought she was demon possessed. He said, just the most terrible, terrible screaming. And he thought, uh oh, what has happened? Well, what had happened was the baby had never seen before, and its eyes came open, and the light frightened that little fella half to death. And it was just screaming because it didn't know what this new sense was. And then after a while, it said the water just began to run out of the baby's eyes. And after a while, they realized it can see. It can see. So that was 1984 when he was there. And Brother John Sacker went with him. John has a real heart for the Orient, and he's been working in China for quite some time. So in, a couple of years later, I crossed paths with Brother Searle in Europe. And he said, Brother Lonnie, he says, I don't have time. But he said, if you ever have a chance to follow up on the work in Korea, I sure would appreciate it. So in 1986, John Sacker and I went to Korea. And we contacted the man, the only man, that Brother Searle had baptized on that trip. And the one reason he was baptized on that trip, he was, he was the one who arranged all the meetings for Brother Searle. And he took him around all the places. So he was the only one that heard, excuse me, everything that was said. And because he'd heard everything, he kind of recapped it and said, hey, if I have understood right, then water baptism in the, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is not right. And water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is right. Did I hear right? He said, you heard right. He said, my wife and I want to be rebaptized correctly. So he baptized them, and he left. So we went to this same man, and he was interested because of what he had learned. And lo and behold, he's the one that's taking me around. And after a while, he draws a conclusion. Brother Lonnie, if I'm hearing you right, every denomination is wrong. I said, you're hearing me right. Well, then we need to start a church of our own. And so he was a fairly wealthy man. And so he had space in a building where he owned the building. And so, so he gave us space to start holding, holding meetings in, in this uh, church building. And side beside us in that church building was also an area rented out to a small seminary. They might have had 40 students. And the, the seminary leader spoke English. And one day he, he had met me and we had talked and uh, just exchanged things. And he knew I was the preacher. And one day he said, Lonnie, would you teach a class for us? I said, yeah, sure, be glad to. 
And I said, what time? How long? And he says, how long? I says, can you give me an hour and a half? I said, fine, no problem. So I went in and I took the Old Testament tabernacle and I compared it to body, soul, and spirit. And I compared it to justification, sanctification, baptism, the Holy Ghost, steps of the new birth. And we went over that whole thing like that. And when I finished, he dismissed the class and he walked up to me and he said, I'm shocked. I couldn't read him. I didn't know what he meant. I said, what are you shocked about? I've never heard teaching like that in all my life. Where do you get all this? He said, what seminary did you go to? And I says, I've never been to any seminary. What? You've never been to a seminary? He says, and you teach things like that. You know? And so then I had to tell him about a prophet. And so then he said, would you preach our convention? And I says, what denomination are you? He said, Presbyterian. I said, look, there's two steps to this. I tell you, I will preach your convention. I says, but I won't preach your convention. What do you mean? I said, I'm accepting your invitation, but I said, I'll never make it to that pulpit. He says, what do you mean? Because I said, you're a Presbyterian. And I don't teach Presbyterian doctrine. They won't let me up there. Oh, yes, brother, we're free in the gospel. We're free to stay with the word. I said, you're going to find out you're not free. And he said, well, I think we are. And I said, well, you'll see. If they accept, I'll be glad to be there. About three days later, he came back. He says, you're right. They asked, what Presbyterian school did you go through? And I says, he, he never went through a school where we can't have him. He, might, he may not teach our doctrine. He says, but he teaches from the Bible. I said, sorry, we can't have him. I said, see, I told you. So our, group, little, our little group grew to about 70 or 75 people very fast. I've told you this part before. And then some, some magazine came in, sat through one of our meetings, and picked up some of our material, and then printed that material in a magazine that they put out. And they were very well-known Christian magazine. And we were headline news. Antichrist move comes to Seoul, Korea. They deny the Trinity. And we were the front page. And then an article inside with excerpts from the Church Age book and illustration of the Church Ages. And of course, they came against everything. And the very next service, we dropped from 70 some odd people to 15. And I won't go into the details because I, I had a lot of, I learned a lot from that one also. But anyway, the church is finally starting to grow back, grow back up again. I used to stay in Korea. I'd stay there 30 days, and I'd stay out 30 days, and I'd stay there 30 because my visa would only allow me to stay 30 days. So I'd stay 30 days and come out, and then Brother Richard Gerberti, who was from Tucson at that time and still is now, and his wife Tina, they would started coming in. After I'd been there a while, he contacted me and says, can I help you? I said, I need help. So we worked together a while to be sure we were going in the same direction, and then, then I would take 30 days, he would take 30 days, I would take 30 days, he would take 30 days, until finally a Korean pastor raised up, and then we kind of left it more in their hands. On one of the trips in about uh, 88, Jeff and Debbie came over to see what was happening in Korea, and either on the way there or on the way back, I forget which, they stopped in Okinawa with, uh, Kim's not here tonight, but Kim and her family, and because her family's there, and Kim and Larry came over and met Jeff and Debbie. And out of that, then a few people were baptized, and God again confirmed the world. A little blind girl was healed. And, uh, and um, so the group started out of that. And then it's kind of sat dormant for years because nobody followed up on it. I think Ted Pesedley went in and preached once, and they were kind of lifted up, settled back down again. And then a uh, black brother from Africa uh, started making trips over there, and we were, we were paying paying for his airplane trips back and forth. He was a student in Japan, and we were paying for him to go over there and minister to him. And then it started spreading again. And so more people on Okinawa are now familiar with the message. In 1986, I started going into Poland and Czechoslovakia with Brother Bautenkamp from Holland. <clears throat> and Brother Zalas was usually my translator. And uh, it was August of 91 before Russia fell under the communism and the USSR dissolved a little bit later and became the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States. And so then Nikolai, Pavel, and Anatoly, they all used to come to my meetings over in Poland and Czech Republic, and they liked what they heard, so we formed a nice bond. During this time also was also trips to Korea and the Philippine Islands during this time. We continued our work into Poland and Czechoslovakia. In 1996, we moved on into Lithuania because by now uh, uh, Nikolai was a pastor of a small church and Pavel was working with him. And so uh, God was putting together a very special church. Stay with me just a little longer. I'd like to finish it tonight. They were putting together a very special church because here we are in Lithuania where the official language, of course, would be Lithuanian. And yet this whole church is Russian speaking. Of course, it had to be under communism. But for us to reach the rest of 
the USSR, Lithuanian language would do us no good. But this group preaches in Russian, does everything in Russian. So now we, we can work with a language that will reach all the former USSR because the USSR forced the people to learn Russian. So now, no matter what nationality they are, what their native language is, all the old, older people all speak Russian. So it made it easy for us to start spreading. So then Nikolai was the pastor, Nikolai Stepanenko. He's about two years, I think, older than me. And then his son, Pavel, he's been here. Most of you will remember him. He is a true apostle. He didn't know who he was for a long time, but now he knows. And he's really doing a great job. Pavel's son, Dima, has taken a joy in learning both video and still photography and, and goes with daddy quite often to, to record the trips. His number two son, Mark, is becoming a real excellent piano player. And they have a Valieri, which is their Franco Grillo. And he, he, handles, he handles, but he handles all the music and the audio and the video and the sounds, everything. He handles everything. And uh, his wife uh, is a very talented player on the, uh, I want to say mandolin. Yeah, mandolin. Very talented player on the mandolin. And uh, she's able to take our English songs, which she gets off of the videos, translate them into Russian, and yet keep it with a meter and a poetic rhyme. She's doing an excellent job on, on translation. And so they, if you go sit in the church in Vilnius, uh, a lot of the songs you'll hear are right off of our videotapes. And they, and they really do nice. So they got a great team of musicians, just like we do. And then they have a brother, Sagitas, who knows how to run the printing press and take care of the computers. We furnish them with tape players, video cameras, wireless mics, uh, VHS duplicators, uh, overhead projectors, video projectors. We send monthly regularly money regularly for videotapes. Uh, you've helped Pavel buy a car. We've helped him financially each month out of the same church, brother Alexei Kudakov. Uh, is supported out of there. We've also helped him. Uh, well, Brother Kudakov actually is supported by Brother Cobb's church because he took it on. Uh, took it, we didn't have to t keep it. He took it. And so he's supporting Alexei. And then we helped him buy a car recently. And so he's, uh, but he's now up ministering and may or may not stay up where the Dima is in Latvia. And of course, we support Dima, who's a full time translator. And then Anatoly Strelkov in Belarus, we support him monthly, who, by the way, is needing a car. It's going to cost about $5,000, and we've only got about 1000 set aside for it so far. We support one minister in Russia. Uh, I'll say three and a half ministers in Ukraine, because one has some support, but we just assist him a little. One in Belarus, two in Lithuania. We pay for the printing of two books a month in Vilnius, two books a month in Russia, two books a month in Ukraine. We provide blank tapes for the several tape duplicators that we and others have placed in several locations around Russia, Ukraine, and Latvia, and Lithuania. And the brothers in Latvia, with some of the computer smarts, they have developed the Russian search program. And so about 300 books in the Russian language are in the computers, and they can search it just like we can. And so we've attempted there, because of that, to be sure that every minister has a computer. and. Um, I have to admit that in one sense, of all my years of missionary work, I feel, I feel it was primarily training me for this last push of mine, uh, physically push of mine in the Russian speaking, because, because I, I, I want to back off from all the travel. And God has placed it in the heart of Brother Barry Coffey, Brother Eugene Brown, and Brother Jason Watkins to work closely with us. And I've talked to Brother Barry kind of about like being my extension over there. If he would take that place, he said he'd be glad to. So my desire is to back off from so much personal activity uh, in Russia and see if we can see what kind of seed is in between, visualize your map now, in between Israel and China. Got a picture in your mind? What's the religion there? Whole thing's Muslim. So I want to see what we can do there. And uh, I was, as I was writing the report, I was thinking over various things. And I remember one time, Brother Nikolai, we're talking about all the wonderful things that had happened since we met in 1986. And he says, oh, good things have happened, Brother Lonnie, since God gave us you. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of a gift from being God. Yeah. But I have to say that since God has put it in your hearts to stand behind us in 
reaching this elect lady wherever she may be. It, w without that, nothing would be happening. All of my efforts would be solitary and minuscule as they were in the beginning days if it wasn't for the fact that God's put it on your hearts just like he's put it on mine. I'm doing my part, you do your part. And so I'm going to close on my ministry and my testimony right there. Kind of got you up to date. I left out a lot of the more personal stuff. You get to be feeling embarrassed about that stuff after a while. So, yeah. Jeff, musicians, <clears throat> come on up. God bless you, saints. You've been very patient to listen to the testimony all the way along. And uh, even, even Paul said to Kathy the other day, I've learned some things about my dad I didn't know. And <laughs>